So sometimes when you read the Bible, there's a lot of good stories or truths, but uh, remember, invite someone, if you're 30 years old, invite someone next week to be part of that fellowship at the end. Uh, when you read the Bible, a story, uh, you might not see it at first, like, why is this in the Bible? All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable to encourage us, teaching, and all of that. But sometimes when you read it, you don't even know, why is this happening? Let's read one of those parts. I'm gonna stop and then just, I'll uh, summarize the end of the story. But David, the, the uh, second king of Israel, but God's favorite, Jesus is called son of David. David is the king who succeeded Saul. Saul was the people's choice. David was God's choice. But David has been through lots of stuff. Saul tried to kill him many times. He's been in the wilderness. He's writing a lot of the Psalms. Where are you, God? You gotta come and help me. Uh, his, his, uh, he has people around him who are betraying him. He's living in rocks and caverns and just, and for no reason. He didn't do one thing wrong. But through thick and thin, through all of this, he has finally become the king of Israel. At first, he's just king over two of the tribes, and then all the tribes have come together. And now he's moved the Ark of the Covenant into its place in a tent that he set up. And he has finally, he's at the top of his life in terms of blessings, it seems, and conquered territories. So he's at a high. That's important to remember. So now we read this, 1 Chronicles 21. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David, you're gonna hold that there, Nicole, to take a census of Israel. The name Satan is only mentioned three times in the Old Testament. Once in Job, once in Zechariah, and now here in 1 Chronicles. So Satan rose up against Israel and he incited David to take a census of Israel. So we're gonna count the people. So David said to Joab, his military commander, and the commanders of the troops, go and count the Israelites from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, talking back to the king, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? We'll get to that later, but he's, he's saying to David, don't do it. David, David, King David, oh, mighty one, don't do it. So, the king's word, however, overruled Joab. You know, he's the king, Joab's just a soldier. So Joab left and went throughout Israel and then came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men, which is really what David was after to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000, 1 1.1 1 .1 million men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 just in the huge province of Judah. But Joab did not include Levi, that tribe, and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. What in the world is going on? It was repulsive to him. This command was also evil in this, ah, Joab was onto something. This command was also evil in the sight of God. So he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Okay, so we're gonna go back to verse one in a second. So let me tell you the rest of the story. So God, in chastening and punishing David for what he did, which you and I are trying to figure out what did he do, he offers David three Choices of punishment, David says, don't let me fall into the hands of men. Let me fall into the hands of God because God is full of mercy. 
I have messed up, I have sinned. Notice how quickly David was to repent. That's what made him so special to God. Not that he was perfect, but that when he sinned, he didn't blame someone else and become the victim and all of that. He said, no, it's me, I'm wrong. So now God begins to judge Israel and a whole bunch of people are dying and God is ready, it so angered him to... uh, punish Jerusalem even worse. Listen to this. This is important. It brings us right to -to up-to-date thing in the news. And uh, David sees the angel over Jerusalem and ready to strike it, but God says, no, don't strike it anymore. And then God sends someone to David and tells him that angel was standing over a certain threshing floor of a man named Arona, and he said, go and build an altar there and sacrifice to God, who's gonna spare you from what he could have done. So David goes there, and he builds, he wants to buy that area of land because he God just told him, build an altar there. And Arona says to him, uh, you can just have it. And David goes, no, 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 no. Nothing that I'm gonna use for God is gonna come cheap. I'll pay, don't give me a freebie. I'll pay for this land. And he builds an altar there. And they sacrifice. And that altar becomes the place where all sacrifices are to be made to God. So that when Solomon follows David, they build the temple right on that spot. That spot out of this story is where God chose the place for the temple to be built, where the sacrifices could continually be made. Now note the Jewish people have no place to do sacrifices because they don't own that land anymore. Right now, over that place that I'm telling you about is the Mosque of Omar, the second or third most holy site for the Muslim religion. And the mosque is there, and that's the only place the temple could have ever been. You couldn't sacrifice any animals anywhere else, only in the temple, which was in the spot where God had stopped his judgment on Jerusalem and where God told David through a prophet, go and build an altar for me there. So that's the spot. And people who believe that the Jews want to, Israel wants to uh, reestablish worship, with animal sacrifices, they know they cannot do it. The only sacred site is that mosque, which is where the mosque is. And the Muslims are not gonna give up that land and that mosque. So let's go back to verse one, try to figure this out and what's it tell us? So Satan rose up against Israel and cited David to take a census of Israel. This is only the one of three places in the Old Testament where Satan's name is mentioned. He's the adversary. He's the tempter. And we've lost sight of the, Satan's main goals. Satan's main thing is to tempt you and tempt me to sin against God. We've so gotten into demon possession and demon control and casting out and all of those have their place. It's taught in the New Testament. So, but the main thing that Satan does is he tempts. And he tempted David. See that word? The word is he incited David. So I looked at that word in one of my helps for Hebrew words. The word there in the Hebrew comes from a word to prick. It means, i.e., to stimulate, to seduce, to entice, to persuade, to provoke, to stir up. Satan came and somehow provoked, stirred up, incited David, enticed him to do this census. So let's just think about that now. Notice, when did Satan come to him? When he was at the height of his career. So Satan t- and Satan tempts all the time, am I correct? Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into, but deliver us from the evil one. So that's a prayer we're supposed to pray every day. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness when he was very weak. And by the way, if Satan has the gall to tempt Jesus, don't you think he's gonna tempt us? 
He's going to try to, I'm sorry, he's going to try to lure us away and incite us, tempt us, seduce us into doing, saying, thinking, looking at things that are against God's will for our lives. So notice this now. When we're especially susceptible to temptation is when we're very low and disappointed and emotionally depressed or when we're high up and we've been blessed and blessed and blessed. That's when Satan looks for that re relaxation of our watching and our being careful. So Satan will tempt anybody anytime, but notice he tempts us, he tempts everybody. He tempts pastors, he tempts members, he tempts choir members. We have to be honest enough to say that and ask for prayer when Satan is trying to incite us to give up, quit, go crazy, get angry. Um, but when you're very high up and you're elated and you just got a victory and you uh, hit the number, uh, no, don't play the number, but <laughs> did something else that brought, that brought blessing to you. When you're exalted like that inside or exhilarated, better word, when you're like that, be careful. That's when he comes because that's when we relax. When we say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh, that prayer was answered. I got a raise on my job. Man, just everything, be careful. Satan watches. He hit David when David was at his peak of his career. So he taught, he tempted him to take a census of Israel. Now, immediately we read that Joab, his general said, don't do it. Well, the Old Testament tells us that God several times ordered a census to be taken for taxation, for counting military men like this one, but God, God led it. God spoke about it. God said, take a census. This one was provoked by Satan. So what's the deal? David always had nothing living in caves and rocks. And then he got some men to, to be, come along with him. 30, then 60, then a couple hundred. And now that he's on the throne and everything is together, Satan was tempting him. You got it made now. Just count those little suckers out there. You got an army. Nobody can overtake you. Count them. Count them to see how much you have. You're strong now. Count them. And David fell into the trap. Count them. Joab, go and count them. And what God, angered God was, was this. That's not your security. I am your security. Not your soldier. Your soldiers aren't going to protect you. I'm going to protect you. Wouldn't matter if you had two or two million. I'm your source. And when you look away at something else, you're, you're denying me and my faithfulness. That's what incited God. And that happens to us. A lot of you thinking of retirement, some of you, you're counting your IRA and you're looking at your bank account. Stop going on the phone and checking your account, what you have. That's not your security. God is your security. Can we say amen? God is. God is our security. We use everything that's logical and that's reasonable to find a new job, but we got, can't take your eyes off of God. If you put your eyes on Uncle Tony because he promised you such and such, you're not, your eyes are not on God. You can't have your eyes on Uncle Tony and on God at the same time. Could God use Uncle Tony? Yes, he can. But if you look at Uncle Tony, God's gonna get upset with that because now you're not trusting him, you're trusting to man. Don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in the Republicans. Don't put your trust in the Democrats. Don't put your trust in anything but the Lord God Almighty. Can we say amen to that? So, so that's what incited God or angered God because Satan said, don't look at God like you used to when you had nothing. Oh, how many times have I seen that? People get married, they don't have two nickels to rub together. 
and they're hugging each other at the altar. You pray for them, they get married, they're serving God, and then God blesses them, they get a better job, they get a nicer apartment. Now they're buying nicer furniture and they're putting all that plastic on it so it'll stay for a long time. You go to their house, you sit down, you can't get up, the thing is stuck to you. Oh yeah, I've been there, done that. How many know what I'm talking about exactly? No, we gotta preserve it. You would think the sofa was an idol. And what happened now? They're not so involved in church anymore. Why? The blessing of God becomes a curse. That's what Satan was doing here. God's blessed you with all these soldiers. Count them. Count them. You're David. You're somebody. You got 1.1 million ready to defend you. You used to have nobody. Nobody used to have God. What would you rather have, 1.1 million or have the Lord Jesus Christ on your side, amen? So that's what set David, in, put him in a bad place. Notice how clever, demonically clever Satan is. He can tempt many different ways and he tempted David many different ways, but the first, this temptation was just so seductive. Count what you have. That's what some of you here watching online, when you look at your life, you think you have it because you're in the union. Oh yeah, that's your security because the union's gonna defend you no matter what you do. You'd not show up for work for a year. The union will still protect you. The union is not your protection. God is your protection. The Lord is our shepherd. Come on, one more time, loud, let's clap. Do we plan? Do we organize? Yes. But the future of our children is not based on what schools we can get them into. The future of our children is based on the faithfulness of God because we dedicated our children. That's the security. So that's why the Bible always says, don't look to the right or to the left. What is that always being repeated for? No, keep your eyes on God. He's my source. Look, I'll get a resume, I'll do all of that, but my new job is gonna come from God, not from somebody else. So, David fell for it and brought judgment, not only on himself, but on the people of Israel. So I wanna ask you all and those watching online, how is it with you? Are you counting your soldiers? You're counting your money, your retirement. Oh, you've been so wise. Thank God for wisdom. Thank God for any blessing you have. But is that your security? The moment you make that your security, God can take it away in a second. In a second, it could be gone. But when you have your eyes on God, he gives you himself, his faithfulness, and everything that we need. I've told this before, but I'm gonna tell it again, although it's a little embarrassing to me, but it happened, it's true. So buying this building and where we were in a theater on Foppish Avenue for those visiting prior involved multiplied, multiplied millions of dollars that had to come from somewhere. We went into it, the pastors and I, uh, we felt this was where God wanted us to go, but the place was just ramshackled and just a mess. They had made it into four theaters, two upstairs, two downstairs. Then they, Cineplex was the company they took off. I believe broke their lease. And here it was sitting vacant, but it was prior to 9-11 and nothing was happening in downtown Brooklyn. It was, it was, it was Dodge City, a lot of violence. So anyway, we got into this building. It's a long story and God helped us and did so many things, provided money. I was on a Christian television program and the guy asked me before I left, uh, how are you doing in Brooklyn? I told him we're looking at this building and um, uh, I'm negotiating on it. They were asking $8.9 million for this building and three office buildings connected to it, each five stories high. And um, I didn't have any money, but I wore a suit every time I went to negotiate, try to, try to look like I was 
You know, like, yeah, of course. So he said, really? I said, yeah, we're negotiating, just pray for us. So the next Tuesday, uh, one week after I was on the program, uh, he sent uh, uh, um, a check for a million dollars um, and said, our, our, our program believes in what you're doing. So that was God saying, move ahead. So a lot of stuff happened, just God helping, God supplying. But one season, because when you go into construction, there's two rules. It never is done when they say, and it never costs what they tell you. All in favor, say aye to that. That's, just take that to the bank. So we had another adventure when we were needing, God, you're listening to me. You know I don't remember the exact situation because there have been so many, but about 15, 16 17 years ago, we needed, what, $400,000 that we didn't have or whatever it was. And a man who gave us, a businessman from Chicago, dear brother, he gave us a million dollars, a separate million dollars when we needed it. And um, he said to me, Pastor Jim, on Sunday, I'm bringing some friends from Florida I said, oh, good. I'll, can you say hello to them? Yeah, I said, I will. He says, he's worth 700 million. He loves the Lord and he writes big checks. <laughs> that was the description of this man. What I'm telling you now is God is listening. And I went, really? He said, listen, j just with one signature, he could take away all your problems. And then some. So, well, praise God. So, Sunday comes, and he's sitting about the sixth row right here with his family entourage. My friend's there too, and I'm over here. And I check to see where he is. I wanted to make sure he got a seat. <laughs> this is the truth. If it embarrasses me, it embarrasses me. So I'm sitting here and uh, we're worshiping God and the choir singing. And I looked again and I thought, is he enjoying the meeting? <laughs> no. Is he, is he getting blessed? Is he enjoying it? Oh, I sure hope he's enjoying this song. <laughs> and God hit me with a lightning bolt that none of you could see. He hit me right there, right there, and said, you're looking at him? That's your answer? After all I've done for you, you're gonna look at some guy from Florida as your answer? Shame on you. When have I ever failed you? When did I let you in the church down? And I did some repenting over here. I got saved all over again. I wanted, I wanted to fill up the baptistry and get baptized again. But I'm not the only one who's done that. Some of you have done that. And some of you are looking every day and thinking your bank account is your answer and your investments and how smart you are. You're not that smart. You're not smarter than God. I'm telling you in the name of the Lord, put your trust in the Lord. Come on, put your trust in the Lord. What was the offering that meeting? Less than usual. I believe he took some money out of the uh, basket when it came by. That's what I believe happened. Now that's the truth, that's for that. What a lesson. I was counting my soldiers. Please, let's not count our soldiers. Let's trust God. So then with that comes a little thought that the Lord gave me this week. One time, it's right in keeping with that. Jesus was doing ministry and he had already fed 5,000. Let's see if you know your Bible with... Um, how many loaves and fishes? Five loaves and two fishes, right? But he had another feeding program. 
And that was when he fed 4,000. So let's look at this. Goes right with David counting his men. During those days, another large crowd gathered, and since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Jamal, if you'd come, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days, and they have nothing to eat. Notice how Jesus, he's facing the cross, but he's not worried about himself. He's worried about the multitudes that they might run out of gas and be hungry. Oh God, give us that kind of heart. Not just me, myself, and I, and my family, and what I need, but how about the folks around us? If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? I mean, be reasonable. We're out 20 miles from nowhere and we got 4,000 people. How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. You know, that's what Jesus is always saying to us. Don't tell me what you don't have. Tell me what you do have. We're ready with negative things of I can't, I don't have, I'm not educated, I'm too old, I'm too young, etc. Jesus asked, seven, they replied, seven loaves. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves, let's say those loaves came from little Italy, like that new member. Let's say they were Italian bread this long. Seven, siete, 4,000 people. That's a joke. That's a joke, okay? To feed uh, five or six people, yeah, 10 people, I got it. 4,000, you got seven loaves. He broke them when he had taken the seven loaves and he gave thanks. He broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them and also told the disciples to distribute them. The people and the people ate and were satisfied. 4,000. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. But here's what I want to share with you. Don't count your soldiers. But thank God for whatever you have, even though it seems so small. You know what we're guilty of? We're so caught up with, I can't do it, I can't make it, I don't have it, I'm a victim, this and that, and then we don't thank God for what we have. Now, when Jesus took seven loaves and a few little fish, notice what he did? He thanked the Father for it. Why are you thanking the Father for something that's ridiculous? You have to feed 4,000 people. What are you thanking for seven loaves? You know what we would have been doing? We would have been complaining. Like disciples, is this a joke? I got to feed 4,000 people. That's what you're giving me? Seven loaves? No, he didn't. He said, oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for what you've given us here. Oh, here's two little fish from Prospect Park Lake. We caught them. Let's bring them. (laughs) Father, I thank you for the fish. I thank you, Father. And then the multiplication began in his hands. I become so convicted that we Christians are not thanking God because we think it's too little. We're always looking at we don't have instead of thanking him for what we do have. If you thank him for what he already has given you, he'll give you even more. Can we say amen by clapping our hands? But a lot of us have that it's never enough syndrome. It's never enough. I don't have what I need. Thank God for what you have. But pastor, I'm, 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 I'm getting public assistance. Thank God for what you have. Thank God for that. I know, but what I want, I know. Let God take care of that, but thank him what you do have because now you're being ungrateful. Don't count your soldiers and think that that's your security, but at the same time, whatever you do have, thank God for it. And some of you are really behind on Thanksgiving with God. I say that with authority. You really better start catching up on thanking God. All you look at is what you don't have and what someone else has and how you missed out on this and how inflation is high. I I got all that, 
But how about thanking God for what you do have? I don't care if it's seven loaves and two fishes. Thank him for it. Thank him for it today. Our security is not in what we do have in terms of abundance. David learned that. Our, our security is in God. But whatever God has given us today, can't we thank him? No, I mean really. Look at me up there in the balcony. When was the last time you just took five minutes to thank God for what you did, do have? I know, but pastor, I would have so much. I'm not interested in that story. I would have had so much more. Thank him for what you have. Even if it's a ridiculous thing. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. What? That must have been the most ridiculous picture. Jesus with seven loaves and a couple of fish and there's 4,000 people and he's saying, thank you, Father. We would have tapped him and said, no, no. You got to send out Uber Eats. They work here. They, they'll, care, they'll bring something. No, 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 no. I'm going to thank them for what I do have. Oh, there's such a release in that. It'll kill worry. Just thank them for what you have. Come on, choir. Come behind me. God is good. How many with uplifted hand can say God has been so good to you? How many today, like me, you have more than you deserve? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Lift, lift it up. Lift it up. More than we deserve. Praise the name of the Lord. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days. I've been held in your hand. Sing. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing it again. I love you. special thanksgiving come out of your seat if you have special thanksgiving come on right here i'm forming the brooklyn tabernacle choir directed by pastor jim simbola come on
lips, your tongue. Come on, don't be embarrassed. Praise Him. Thank Him for what you do have. Don't complain what you don't have. how to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Keep our lives pure and holy and clean. Please, God, we want that more than money. We want to be like you. Our security is not in our bank account, in retirement plans, IRAs, pensions. Promises, what relatives might leave us. Our eyes are on you alone. You are my security. Carol and I have you, and that's all we need. You will take care of business for us. Help us not to look to the left and to the right. Don't let the blessings you've given us become a curse. And finally, Lord, make us thankful today for whatever we have, little or much, in between. Whatever you've given us, stop us from having a complaining spirit, a bitter inner anger, why don't I have more spirit? Help us to just 
humbly thank you for the seven loaves and a couple little fish. It's silly, but it'll be enough if we thankfully give it to you, Lord. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the new members. Thank you for the visitors. Bless them as they go downstairs. Bless the new members fellowship, but God help all of us to do our best with this offering. You know where we are. You know what we need. I'm not going to say more. God, the Holy Spirit, touch hearts today. Touch hearts. I pray Jesus publicly. The Spirit will touch hearts. And we'll praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Do what you want. We're going to sing a little bit. Leave, stay, whatever you want. My Jesus. Stay for a second, sing. Don't move, don't move yet. Sing. Tuesday, we had an exceptional prayer meeting this last Tuesday. People came, some fasting, and they focused in on some mountains that they wanted to see God bring down. But here's what struck me. I shared it with Pastor Brian. He feels good about it. Um, I'm half Polish, half Ukrainian. When I was in Poland, I was wounded when I found out that the number of Christians in Poland is 0.3 percent that's not a half a percent that's 0.5 it's half this is 0.3 when i was in slovakia with my uh, that's okay my uh roma friends i found out one percent of yugoslavia of, of slovakia is evangelical christian um pastor park what was the country you, you gave me this morning? What was it? Japan. Japan, where Nina is from, 0.1%. Now, Paul says in the book of Romans, my heart is stirred, I'm paraphrasing, when I think about my own physical people, biologically, Israel and how they have turned their back on the Messiah. But he agonized over them. So what we're gonna do on Tuesday is if you were born in another country, you're gonna bring that country here in your heart. And we're gonna pray for the country of your birth. If, if there's two countries like mine, we'll find a way to pray. But even if you're born in America, if you're Italian descent, you know what Italy is? Italy is one of the biggest mission fields in the world because it's nominal Catholic, nominal Catholic, secular, and, and, the, and the Christian is so small and half of them are so legalistic, I'm not sure they even understand the gospel. I've been there a few times. So we're going to bring African countries, Caribbean countries, we're going to bring it to the Lord. What are we going to pray? God, visit Poland. How could it be your will that 0.3% are Christians? How many follow what I'm saying? Just lift your hand, okay? Someone's got to stand in the gap and pray. 
And we should have a, a connection with the country of our birth. So you remember Tuesday, you come to the prayer meeting, we're gonna focus in and spend time lifting up Jamaica, lifting up Trinidad, lifting up Nicaragua, lifting up Kazakhstan, with all these countries we heard of. Come on, don't you think that will, how, how many know that will please God? Put our hands together, come on. You may go where you want, we're gonna sing it one more time. <laughs> 